Uh, good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you here tonight. We're going to read a verse in the, or a couple of verses in the book of Isaiah, chapter 32. Isaiah chapter 32. Verse 1, Isaiah 32 and verse 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as an hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Notice that second verse. It is as though Isaiah sweeps across the spectrum of man's need and danger and presents Christ in his complete sufficiency. So whether it's shelter, satisfaction, or shade, whether it is a storm that's coming, whether it is thirst in the soul, whether it is weariness in the heart, there is a Savior. A man shall be as an hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest. Now, I think that uh, on some nights, probably the um, details of history has been somewhat or have been somewhat boring to people who are not particularly interested in history. So I thought that tonight, instead of looking uh, in detail at both of the men that we're going to be thinking about, I will just tell you in a couple of sentences about Nathan Hale, the more famous of the two, and then we'll confine our attention more to John Andre. So as I mentioned the other night, on his return to England, along with the defeated British Army, General, um, pardon me, Sir George Beckwith, then an officer and later the governor of Bermuda, was quoted by the London newspapers as saying, Washington did not really outfight the British, he simply outspied us outspied us. I didn't realize that actually George Washington had a number of spy groups that did not know each other. There was the Mulligan spy group. There, was, um, sp there were spies in Philadelphia. There were spies dealing with the South. There were, uh, they, they used um, invisible ink. They had code names. Washington was referred to as Code 711. New York was referred to as 727. Long Island was 728. The head of it all, Talmadge, was uh, called John Bolton, and his code number was 721. There is one agent that we don't know to this day. She was a woman, Agent 355, and she was killed by the British, and it is likely she who helped to uncover the plot that we're going to look at in a little while. There was a woman spy in Philadelphia who um, actually warned Washington, if you're familiar at all with my area and Valley Forge and the troops that were suffering there at Valley Forge while the British were having a cushy existence in Philadelphia, that they decided they would attack Valley Forge. That woman, Lydia Darrow, she rode to Valley Forge, warned Washington, and the, the general said it, uh, General Harris said later reported Washington didn't seem to be at all surprised by the attack. He couldn't understand how that happened. Had to do with the spies. So, the American spy that we're just going to think about for a moment here is Nathan Hale. He was caught um, in regular clothes, not in his uniform, caught behind enemy lines. He had been gathering very necessary uh, intelligence for Washington, and he was hanged on September 22, 1776. It may be that you know his last words, for which he is very famous when he said, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. The reason that we know that statement is because there was a Captain Montresor, a British captain, who was there at the execution, who later, under a white flag, had been sent to take a message to Washington. And while he was waiting to meet Washington, he mentioned to some of the other officers how, how he was struck by the gentle dignity and his consciousness, quote, of rectitude and high intentions when he was hanged, and that those were his last words. By the way, he was made the state hero of Connecticut by an act of legislature in 1985. So I want you to think, just tuck that away for a moment, his last words, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country, and I want you to think about John Andre. Nathan Hale had been brought up by Puritan parents 
taught the scriptures, apparently a very God-fearing young man, and uh, as a school teacher, before he entered the army and became a spy, he would begin each day in public school, each day with prayer and Bible reading as he was teaching the children the word of God. John Andre also had that kind of an upbringing, only his life was very, very different. He was brought up by Huguenot parents. So if you remember the night that we thought about the French Revolution, the Huguenots were the Bible-believing Christians who had been driven from France, persecuted, many of them killed, but the others fled from France and came to uh, not only these shores, but also to England to escape the persecution. So he was brought up by parents who knew the Bible and taught him the Bible. If you ever get to Westminster in London and you go to Poets' Corner, you will see monuments and memorials to Tennyson, Dryden, Spencer, Shakespeare, Chaucer. And as one person said, you'll find a name there that you won't even know why it's there. And the name is Major John Andre, the man we're looking at tonight. He was a poet. He was a handsome, dashing young man. He was well-liked by both the British loyalists and the American patriots. He was popular at parties and social events. He used to put together plays and poems to entertain the people at the parties. He was the life of the party. When the British were occupying Philadelphia, Major John Andre was there, and he met a young woman uh, that they used to keep company together. Her name was Peggy Shippen. So if you're ever traveling along the Pennsylvania Turnpike and you come to Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, that is named for her grandfather, Peggy Shippen. When the British left Philadelphia and the Americans came in, the officer who came in was a man named Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold met Peggy, Peggy Shippen, fell in love with her, and although there was a lot of years between them, they were wed, they were married. Now, Benedict Arnold had been somewhat soured as a result of what he felt was ill treatment. He had been passed over for promotion. He had been uh, failed to, he felt his government had failed to reimburse him. Uh, and so his words were having, or the words of a biographer, having become a cripple in the service of my country, I little expected to meet ungrateful returns. So when he was faced with financial problems, and he was already annoyed at the government and already annoyed at the army. He voiced some of that concern to Peggy Shippen, and she happened to mention that she knew a British officer named Major John Andre, and that perhaps he would want to talk to him. And so Benedict Arnold thought if he wasn't going to get money from the U.S. government and from the colonial army, maybe he could do a deal with the British. And so it was agreed that he would meet with Major John Andre. Now, John Andre, the major, was given a command by his commanding officer that he was not to go behind enemy lines, and he was never to be out of his uniform. So I'm not going to bore you with the details of what happened, but because of a delay, when he finally met up with the man that he was to talk to and in whose house he was going to meet, Benedict Arnold, it was later than it was supposed to be. So they couldn't stay out and talk there, he said, you need to come back to my house, but his house was behind enemy lines, number one. When it was time to leave, he was delayed. He didn't even realize that the uh, Americans had fired on the ship that was supposed to evacuate him and that that ship had pulled away. When it was time to leave, it was now so late, the man that was going to escort him back to British lines, um, a loyalist named Joshua Smith, said, I, I, I don't want to be seen with you in your uniform. Number two, he took off his uniform and he got into civilian clothes. In his boot, he had what Benedict Arnold had given him, which were the plans of West Point, a very, very, if not the most strategic fort in America at the time. And the British were going to take over that fort with the information that he was bringing back to them. However, Joshua Smith brought him so far, thought they were out of danger, said, okay, you want to walk that way, and pretty soon you'll hit your lines. Joshua Smith leaves. Benedict Arnold, uh, John Andre continues to walk. He gets stopped by three patriots who ask him who he is, who search him, who find the plans, and who arrest him. Here is where it gets bizarre. He had been going under 
a pseudonym, if you will. He had, he had taken a name that would be the signal for, um, for them. And so uh, when he is arrested, the officer to whom he is brought passes the information on to his superior officer that they had captured someone, I believe the name was John Anderson. His commanding officer was Benedict Arnold. When Benedict Arnold heard the name John Anderson and realized that Andre had been captured, he knew the game was up, so he ran. And in fact, the ship that was supposed to uh, bring Andre back to his troops that had pulled back because of fire and now had come back, that ship is the ship, the vulture, that now Benedict Arnold got on and said, we need to escape. So what happened was Andre is captured, Benedict Arnold escapes. Arnold was the traitor. Andre was a soldier working for his, for his, his, his army and his country, and he was a very well-liked person. Washington did not want to hang John Andre. He wanted Benedict Arnold. So he wrote to the British, and he said his words, uh, if I can just find them right here, he said, um, uh, Benedict Arnold was the one who was uh, at the heart of this, and uh, he appears to be the guilty author of the mischief and ought more properly to be the victim. But the British General Clinton had promised Benedict Arnold safety, and to keep his word, he said, no, you can't have Benedict Arnold. So nobody really wanted to hang John Andre, but as Alexander Hamilton said, there was, in truth, no way of saving him. Arnold or Andre would have to be the victim, and Arnold was out of our power. Now, while Andre was being held prisoner in Tappan, or Tapan, the court of inquiry delivered its verdict. He was a spy. He has to be executed. Here's what we know. In his pocket, when he walked to the gallows, now remember, he was an aspiring poet. He wrote poetry. He wrote plays. He, he thought of himself as a poet. In his pocket, there was a poem, a poem that had been written by another man, Jehoiada Brewer. And as he went to the gallows, the words in his pocket are the words, if you've seen them on the back of the handout tonight, and you've heard them from gospel platforms probably many, many times. On Christ, almighty vengeance fell that would have sunk a world to hell. He bore it for a sinful race and thus became my hiding place. So we would love to infer that before they put the rope around his neck, that this man found the hiding place in Christ, since that was his, those were his last words. Now, finally, what about Benedict Arnold? After some not very successful military exploits as a British brigadier general, and after a number of failed commercial ventures, he sailed to London, where he died in 1801. His legacy to mankind was the stained remembrance of a self-promoting traitor. You're not going to find too many people naming their son Benedict any more than they would Judas. Even if someone might bizarrely wish to honor Arnold's memory at his tomb, that is now impossible. He was buried in the Church of St. Mary's, Battersea, but by mistake a clerk entered his name incorrectly into the church records. Then when the church was renovated a century later, the workers, unaware of whose grave they had opened, disinterred Benedict Arnold's body and cast it into an unmarked common grave, along with dozens of other anonymous remains. So I would like you to think about the last words of Nathan Hale. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. And I want you to think about what were the last words in the mind of Major John Andre, the hiding place, Christ, the hiding place from the coming storm of judgment. And I'm going to ask you to think with me tonight about dying with a safe refuge. We all have to die one day. Dying with a safe refuge and dying with a single regret. I only regret dying with a safe refuge, dying with a single, with just one regret. Now, when it comes to spies, let's just back up a minute. When it comes to spies, what people think about the spy depends on a number of things. First of all, is he spying for you or is he spying on you? This determines what you think about him. 
If he's spying for you, you think he's intrepid and he's brave and he's courageous. He's penetrating enemy lines. He's, he's putting his life on the line to get the information you need. He is, he's brave beyond description. But if he's spying on you, you think he is duplicitous and deceitful and treacherous and seditious. So what do you think about a spy? Depends on whether he's spying for you or on you. And even if he is spying for you, what you think of him often depends on whether he is native or foreign. If he is a native of the people on whom he is spying for you, that, if he is, that is, if he's spying on his own people for you, then in the back of your mind there is always the thought that he is untrustworthy and undependable. If he turned on his own people, then it could be one day he would turn on you. So that also factors in what you think about a spy. And finally, is he in the military or is he a civilian? A spy for the military is usually, if not invariably, following orders and risking his life for the good of his country and the aid of his fellow soldiers. But a civilian spy, he's generally in it for money, like Aldrich Ames or Robert Hansen. They're just in it for money. Now, these two spies, these two spies working for their own country were highly respected. And remarkably, remarkably, such was their character that they actually earned the esteem of their enemies, some of whom, of course, were involved in their execution. So think with me then about dying with a safe refuge. You need a shelter. You need a shelter from a storm that's coming. You don't feel that storm. You don't see that storm. Perhaps you rarely think about that storm. Neither did the people of Noah's day. Now, to me, it is absolutely bizarre. It is inexplicable that the people of Noah's day could be so unaware of what was coming. Because the Bible tells us Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And we're not talking about building a canoe in the backyard of his house. We're talking about an ark. If you ever get to Kentucky and you see the ark that's built there to the specks of Noah's ark, you will understand how massive a ship this was. So people knew, people knew what was happening. And apparently as a preacher of righteousness, Noah was telling them what was coming and they were aware. But yet do you remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said in Noah's day, they ate, they drank, they married, they gave in marriage and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Did you hear that word? Knew not. They weren't aware. In other words, it, it is possible to be completely blind to eternal things, to be so immersed in the necessities and niceties of life, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, that you don't even think about eternal things. I wonder if I'm looking into the eyes of people and you've hardly even thought about eternity today. Hardly even thought about where you're going and where you'll be. And you're just a heartbeat away. You're just seconds away. We were, we were talking at supper tonight about the execution of the, the assassination of John Kennedy. Do you know that after he won the nomination and he had to pick a vice president, he was leaning towards selecting Lyndon Baines Johnson and many of his aides were totally against that choice. And it is a well-known event in history where in a side room, John Kennedy said to his aides who were bringing up their objections to Lyndon Baines Johnson, he said, now if I remember correctly, it was, was it 43? I'm, I'm 43 years of old. I'm the, I'm the youngest man to be nominated. He wasn't our youngest president, but he was the youngest man to be nominated for president of the United States. I'm not going to die in office. It doesn't matter who my vice president is. Got that? I'm not going to die in office. I'm the youngest man to be nominated for president of the United States. I'm not going to die in office. It doesn't matter who my vice president is. And there came that fatal day in November where the the crosshairs on that rifle focused in on the head of John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald, as far as we know, pulled the trigger and the youngest man to be nominated for president of the United States went into eternity. Have you thought about eternity today? Have you stopped to think that there's a storm coming that is going to engulf this world? 
First, it will be a storm of man's making as the whole world will be struggling in World War III and on the verge of blasting the planet apart. And then Christ will come back. Are you aware there's a storm of judgment coming and you need a shelter? Listen to some of the words that were in that poem. Arrest, scheme, shelter. Catch those words? Because you see, you are part of a race that's in a long war against God. From the Garden of Eden till now, men and women have been fighting against God. What he wants is your good. What he wants is to bless you. But sin has so twisted our thinking that we run from God. I know the words Major Deegan mean very little uh, to people in California, but the Major Deegan Expressway, part of Interstate 87 in New York City, is a very, very busy, crowded artery in and out of the city, New York. And back in 2009, a dog was hit by a car. And I think you can actually find this video on YouTube. The dog was on the highway, and another dog, and later it was found out that the injured dog was his mother, another dog positioned himself between his injured mother and the cars that had stopped. And every time the police tried to get to the injured dog so they could get it in an ambulance and get it to the vet, this dog, snarling and snapping, would chase them away. Because in the dog's mind, it imagined it was protecting its mother from people who wanted to harm her. Whereas the people who were trying to reach her were trying to reach her to save her. And in your mind, sin has planted the idea it would be okay to be saved before I die, but just right now, I don't, I don't want to be thinking about this now. I don't want to be saved now. And you imagine somehow that God is somebody to be kept at arm's length until you come to the moment when you must die. But what I'm trying to say to you is that your mind has been distorted by sin and that the God that you're running from is a God that wants to save you and bless you and deliver you from this terrible power called sin. And you need a shelter from what's coming. John Andre was arrested by the American militia. I'm hoping that in the words of that poet, he came to understand that God was trying to arrest him. Arrest him. Catch the word rest in, in, in our English word, arrest. It makes you stop. See, you're now caught. I remember when God arrested me. I was drifting through life on cruise control, doing, doing my best not to think about eternity. Not to think. The only time I had peace was when I didn't think about reality. The moment I sat in a gospel meeting and thought about reality, it was disturbing. I didn't want to think about the Lord's coming. I didn't want to think about dying in my sins. I didn't want to think about going to hell. I didn't want to think about the Spirit of God ceasing his dealings with me. When I began to think about any of those things, meeting God, standing in the judgment before God, my peace evaporated. So the way I cope with that is I looked straight ahead, I stared at the preacher, and my mind was miles away because I did not want to think about truth, about reality. But on a July night in 1966, in a gospel meeting like this, God arrested me. And I stopped. I was stopped dead in my tracks. And crashing into my mind and heart and life came thoughts about eternity, swamping me, overwhelming my, my defenses, and bringing me before God with some understanding that I had sinned against that God. I was a guilty sinner. And that if I met God that way, I would perish forever in the lake of fire. Would you please face that tonight for you? Would you please stop running and let God arrest you? Because that poem talks about a scheme, a plan. And although Arnold and Andre had schemed to betray, God had a scheme, a plan to deliver sinners. God's scheme, God's plan involved a searing sacrifice. 
that God would give his only son. God would sacrifice his only son for guilty sinners. God's plan involved a supreme suffering. That the storm that is coming, the storm of wrath that should have beaten upon me in the lake of fire forever, that that storm would beat on Christ at Calvary. That there would be a man who would go into the storm and would sink in the awful waves and would lay a foundation that would never be overturned, that could allow sinners to go in to eternity with a secure foundation on which to depend, that he would suffer so that I would not have to suffer, and that on that cross by his suffering, he would satisfy God. Have you ever stopped to think of what, what, what he did at Calvary and who he did it for and, 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 and what that means? There is a, there's a subway station, an underground train, subway station in Washington, D.C. called L'Enfant, Metro L'Enfant Plaza. I have no idea whether you've been in any subway stations, uh, if you've been to London, if you've been to New York, if you've been to Paris. If you, I, I, but I think what you'll know if you've ever been in them are the people performing there hoping you'll throw a few coins, see, into their, the case for their musical instrument or into a cup or. So on a January day in 2007, a man flipped open his case, took out his violin, reached into his pocket, took out what they call some seed money that they throw in so that anybody passing by sees some money in there and figures, well, you know, others have given to him, maybe I should. Threw some money into the case, put the violin up, and began to play. He played. He played some of the greatest music that's ever been written. He was playing it on a $2 million violin. He is one of the greatest musicians in the world. His name is Joshua Bell. And people were wandering by, some through quarters, see? <laughs> some people didn't even stop. Stacy Fukurawa, she stopped because she couldn't believe her eyes. Joshua Bell, here? She had just paid $100 for the cheapest seats in an in a auditorium where he was playing. That was the cheapest. Those were the nosebleed seats. $100 to hear him. And there he is. She's, she just leaned back like this. And just drank it all in. She couldn't believe it. Here's what she said. It was the most astonishing thing I've ever seen in Washington. Joshua Bell was standing there playing at rush hour. And people were not stopping. And not even looking. Some were flipping quarters at him. Quarters. I was thinking, what kind of a city do I live in that this could happen? Huh? This maestro? Is, 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 is playing f this phenomenal music and most people are ignoring it. And a handful of people that, that thought, well, we should help the old guy out here are flipping quarters at him. Wonder how many times you've walked past Calvary and hardly even thought of what had happened there. Wonder how many times you've heard about it in the gospel meeting and never even stopped to think that the greatest moment in all of recorded history up till that point was taking place right then. The creator was giving his life to save his creatures. Christ was dying for the ungodly. The savior was dying for sinners. The king, crowned with thorns, was sacrificing his life for guilty subjects. God was giving his son for guilty sinners. Have you walked past it without ever stopping to think that you need a shelter? That Christ is the only shelter? 
Just as the ark sheltered Noah by being exposed to the storm, so Christ is able to shelter you because he endured God's wrath. The storm broke over his head. It's hard to imagine what a condemned man thinks, isn't it? Was it Samuel Johnson, the famous linguist, uh, who said, his words are often misquoted, but it was something along the line that um, if a man knows he's going to be hanged in a fortnight, it, it, it wonderfully concentrates his mind, right? If you know you're going to die in the morning, you're not thinking about the lawn, the car's oil. You, your mind has suddenly focused on just one thing, your life, it's ending tomorrow. I wonder what Barabbas was thinking as he was sitting in his cell thinking, I'm dying tomorrow. And when the next day comes and the door is opened and he is dragged out into the light by what he thinks is an executioner, he finds he's pushed away, go away, you're free, because the Lord Jesus was going to be carrying a felon's cross out to Calvary. I wonder what was in the mind of John Andre as he stepped up and the noose was put around his neck. I hope what was in his mind was what was in his pocket, that Jesus is my hiding place, that he bore the judgment that I should have faced in eternity, and that I'm about to go out into eternity, but I have a hiding place from the coming storm. That Savior went to the cross so that you could be saved. Do you know that five years, now remember, John Andre was a poet. Just remember that now. That five years before they put that noose around his neck, a poem had been published in his country, England. And part of what is in that poem are these words Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. There's no doubt about it that a poet would know those words. Let me hide myself in thee. Listen, you need a shelter. Christ is the only shelter. Run to him tonight. Run to him tonight. Do, do not, do not imagine that somehow, someday, down the road, when you're older, then you will become saved. This is your time. This is the night. Heaven is watching. Eternity is in the balance. What you do with the Lord Jesus will determine where you'll be forever. You can turn to him tonight and he'll place you in that hiding place. A man shall be as a hiding place from the storm, as a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. There, there is the hiding place. There is where you will find refuge. He is the one who can give you shelter. Don't put this off for another night. You see, one day you and I will die if the Lord doesn't come. I want you to think about dying with a single regret. Because when they put the noose around the neck of Nathan Hale, his last words were, I only regret, I have one regret. Do you know, the Apostle Paul used language very similar to that. One day with a, a chain around his arm, he was speaking to a, a king. And one of the bystanders, an official, shouted out and said, Paul, you are beside yourself. You're crazy. Much learning has made you mad, has made you crazy. You're babbling insanely. And with great dignity, Paul said, most noble Festus, I'm not, I'm not mad. I'm not crazy. The words I speak are words of truth and soberness. The king knows what I'm talking about. You know the Bible, is what he's saying. You know what the prophets have written. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Did you see what Paul had just done? Paul had shown Agrippa that what the prophets said matched who Jesus was. And now he's saying, now you say you believe the prophets. What are you going to do with the Lord Jesus? And you remember Agrippa's answer, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And what did Paul say? I would to God that not only you, but all that hear me were both almost and altogether just as I am, except for this one thing, these bonds. Just one thing. 
Nathan Hale had just one regret. I'm going to ask you to do some creative thinking just now. Would you do that? It would take maybe five minutes of your valuable time, and then the meeting will be done. Just some creative thinking. Are you ready? If you died tonight, would you regret not having listened better in the meeting here? If you went into eternity tonight, would you look back to the meeting and say, I wish I had listened more carefully? I wish I had focused on what we read in the scriptures. I wish I had thought about the fact that Jesus died on the cross to provide a shelter for me. Would you regret that you didn't listen better? If you died tonight, would you regret not having trusted Christ in this meeting? How much do you regret that salvation is so near to you and so free and so available? Would you regret it? Would you look back and say, why? Why did I let that meeting slip through my fingers? Why did I, why, why did I not trust Christ? Would you regret? If you died tonight, would you regret never having repented of your sins? Would you look back and say, how is it? What, what, what madness was in my mind to make me embrace my sins as if they were pleasant things when what I was doing was, 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 was pulling a viper into my chest and allowing it to kill me? Would you regret? Would, would that be what you would regret? That you were never saved, that you never trusted Christ, and that you never turned from your sins? A number of years ago, I had meetings in Nova Scotia. There was an elderly couple coming to the meetings. We went to visit them one day, another preacher and I. And uh, I, I really can't tell you which of us said something to the effect of this to, to uh, the man and his wife uh, about it's sin that shuts heaven to us, that takes a person to hell. And uh, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And she said something, she responded something like, I, I, I know, I know I'm a sinner. I, I, I know I need to have my sins put away. And her husband piped up and he said to her, oh dear, come on. I've known you for years. You're such a good person. And she said, in some ways, drawing herself up, she said, I am not at all convinced that I want to spend eternity in a burning hell. I am not at all convinced that I want to spend eternity in a burning hell. Do you? Do you? As if I could just look into the eyes of everybody here on my right. Do you want to spend eternity in a burning hell? And here to my left, do you want to spend forever eternity in a lake of fire? If your answer is no, you do not want, then let me just once more tell you, run to Christ tonight. Now, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. That is what the Bible says. Run to Christ for shelter tonight. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, at the close of this meeting, we bow to ask for thy blessing. We are asking for thy spirit.